started here. Uh, good afternoon and thank you all for taking the time to join us over your lunch hour on this Friday afternoon. Uh, my name is Libby Barbie and I'm the program manager at Colorado Creative Industries and we're just really excited to be able to partner with Art of Access and the Colorado Film Office to present this webinar today. And um, we have Damon McLeese uh, in his lawn chair, a director of Denver's Access Gallery. And he'll be moderating this conversation about pivoting to online programming with accessibility in mind. Uh, he'll introduce our panelists and, and a bit more Art of Access and what that group does. Uh, but before we get started, I wanted to go over a few logistics. Uh, first of all, we have uh, ASL interpreters on the call today. Um, I want to give a big shout out to them and also uh, tell you that you can pin their video by going to the top of your screen, clicking on the three dots at the right of their uh, box, and then uh, choosing pin speaker, and that will allow you to see only their, um, their image. We also have captioning available through the link provided in the chat. So just go to the chat and follow that link. I also want to share that today's webinar will be recorded and it will be, be made available on the website of the Colorado Office of Film, Television and Media. And I just wanna give a really huge shout out to Kelly Bogg in the film office who has made this webinar possible today. I also want to thank the collaborative of the SCFD and the Colorado Business Committee for the Arts for helping to market this webinar. And without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Damon to introduce the panelists and start the conversation. All right. Damon. Well, thank you so much, Libby. Um, yes, yeah, so I'd also like to give a big shout out to uh, Kelly and just everyone who helped put this together. My name is Damon McLeese. I am a fairly large white man with a, a quickly growing gray beard, wearing a gray sweatshirt and black rim glasses, sitting out on the back porch on a beautiful Colorado day. Um, my role at Access Gallery is I'm the executive director. Through that role, uh, many years ago, we started a group called the Art of Access Alliance Denver. If there are any members of the team on board today, uh, please identify yourself in the chat. We'd love to give you a shout out. The Art of Access Denver also has a website that we'd like to direct people to for inf information about accessibility and um, inclusion models, most specifically or most lately around this topic of pivoting towards accessibility um, in the time of COVID. Uh, accessibility for people with disabilities has clearly taken on a different meeting over the last seven or eight months. and as we were talking about putting together this webinar, I wanted to get three rather distinct voices. And I invited Nicole Cromarty from uh, the Clifford Still Museum. Hi, Nicole. Um, Emily von Swearingen, who is a teaching artist that is working with both deaf and blind students still during the pandemic. And my friend, Lisa, who's on the Art of Access Committee from Lone Tree Art Center to share a little bit about their experiences and what they've learned, what they would do differently. Um, I tend to be a very, very informal moderator. So what I've asked everyone to do is give a quick introduction to themselves, what they're doing, their viewpoints on accessibility in the time of COVID or maybe not during the time of COVID. And then um, when we come back, we'll have a couple of questions and we really would love to entertain questions from the audience um, about the topic anything that is on your mind, anything that you'd like a little bit more information about, this is the time to do it. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to, um, let's just start with Nicole because she's in the top left of my screen. Hello, Nicole. Hello, thanks so much, Damon. And thanks to the Art of Access and Colorado Creative Industries for putting this webinar together. It's such an important topic right now. and. I know we're having a lot of conversations informally on the side about what we're all doing at each other's organizations. So it's great to bring us together in this virtual space. So um, what was the pivot for the Clifford Still Museum and thinking about what it means to pivot with accessibility in mind? Well, of course there were so many organization-wide things that just got turned upside down during this time period from closure to now reopening. Uh, but I'm gonna really focus on the programmatic aspects of what that pivot looked like. 
So as soon as we closed to the public in March, everyone had the same question, what would we do now with public programs? Um, we do not have a history of doing virtual or online programs at the Clifford Still Museum. So this was a really big question of how we would approach this. Um, in April, we decided to rewrite the education and programs philosophy um, to help us frame this movement and move forward in this really uncertain time at the start of the pandemic. Our new philosophy included things like learning about and prioritizing the needs of our community and audiences during this time, honoring existing contracts with artists who we feared would be disproportionately financially impacted by the pandemic, recognizing the critical importance of accessibility and potential platforms and their appropriateness and availability for our audiences. And this one was really important, focusing on experimentation rather than perfection. And we certainly practice that every day. Um, I hope that these four points give you um, sort of a sense of uh, context of how we made the choices that we did. Um, I think this philosophy really helped us move forward in this really uncertain time. Um, we were all really committed to this new view on programming and there was 100% buy-in um, from the whole team about prioritizing access, which as you all know is critical. Um, so we were ready to sort of take the leap into the unknown together. So um, with this new vision in place, we decided to make some decisions. Um, we decided to move the programs that we'd already planned online and figure out what that looked like for us. Um, next, we contacted the artists that had programs scheduled with us, several of whom had also not done virtual programs, um, but were game to work with us and figure out what that looked like. And then we started researching potential platforms. Um, we um, for accessibility reasons, mainly decided to go with Zoom as our main platform um, for public programs and tours. We really liked that uh, participants didn't need access to the internet or to a computer to use Zoom. Um, they could access just dialing up on their phone. And it seemed like early on, a lot of people were using Zoom. So we were excited to utilize a tool that our audiences might be using somewhere else and we're starting to get familiar with. With Zoom, one of the features that we took advantage of from the start, um, and I think this was something that uh, Damon really called out for us, was um, that we were excited to be able to include captions as a part of our programs. And in our early experiments with captions, um, we actually had one of our education staff members provide all of the captions for our programs. And this worked pretty well, particularly for programs that were at least somewhat scripted. Um, she was able to copy and paste large chunks of text. As we developed programs that were less scripted, um, we made a move to using Otter, which is an automated text transcription application. And Otter uses artificial intelligence and machine learning technology. And we found it to be pretty accurate. Otter is great because you can teach the program specialized vocabulary. Um, and the example of the Clifford Still Museum, uh, like telling that the name Clifford is spelled with a Y and not an I, which is a really nice thing to have. Um, I should also mention we are forever grateful to local partners who really pushed us to think more deeply about accessibility online. I want to share just a couple of examples of the ways we worked with partners during this pivot. So in preparation for a full day of virtual programming to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act with this past summer, we worked closely with colleagues from the Atlantis community, Rocky Mountain ADA, and the Colorado Advisor Advisory Council for the Persons with Disabilities. These organizations were amazing in providing resources for our staff, um, giving, giving feedback on our plans and how we might make our programs more accessible, um, and helped us connect with audiences who might be looking for ways to celebrate the ADA anniversary after so many in-person celebrations had been canceled due to COVID restrictions. Um, with their help and many others, we created a mixture of programs that were both pre-recorded and live. One other quick example that I have to mention um, is working with Laredin, which is a Denver-based organization who provides services and children uh, services to children and adults with intellectual, developmental, and other disabilities. Um, they've been a really critical partner to help us shape what on an online arts program for their adults with disabilities could look like. 
our education team had been working on a monthly visit to Laridon before um, the pandemic was struck. Um, and two educators on our team really took the lead at reimagining what this could look like online. Um, this quickly shifted to a weekly program based on demand. Um, and then I think more recently has really transitioned to being monthly, but essentially the educators worked really closely with Laridan's program manager and the participants themselves, um, ensuring that we were co-creating meaningful experiences for the Laridan community. Um, another great aspect of this program was that the CSM educators sent art supply kits to the individual participants. These kits gave participants access to supplies um, that they might not have on hand while they are participating from their homes. We worked with Linguabi, who's providing American Sign Language for this webinar today um, for each of those programs. And having an interpreter allowed education staff to connect with one of the participants who is deaf in a way that would never be possible otherwise. Uh, the very first interpreter who was booked for the program had great energy, was very flexible, very personal, and quickly developed a rapport with the deaf participants. So um, following that first visit, the educators were really intentional about um, booking the same interpreter for each visit, which turned out to be really critical. The interpreter continued to build relationships with the educators and all of the participants, um, learned specialized vocabulary used in our arts programming. She was truly part of the program itself and a big part of its success. Um, there's so much more I could say about pivoting with accessibility in mind and bragging on the thoughtfulness and the hard work of all of my colleagues at CSM and partners in the community, but I'll just wrap up with a couple notes on what's next. This has been an incredible time of learning for all of us at CSM. We've learned so much about tech platforms, accessibility, and the reach of programs based online. We've seen participation from across the country and internationally. Uh, we've taken the opportunity to participate in webinars like this, trainings, readings, and really leaning, as I said, on the expertise of our community partners. We're currently planning for a keynote lecture in March, which will be hosted on Zoom, English captions provided by Otter, ASL provided by Linguabi, and for the very first time, we'll offer Spanish language simultaneous translation by the Community Language Cooperative, which is a Denver-based um, translation provider. Um, there's still so much to learn in this area, and I cannot wait to hear from my co-panelists today. Zoom, of course, has new features every day, so we'll continue to find ways to make our offerings more accessible and inclusive. We're currently working with Create Knowledge, which is a Denver-based evaluation firm that centers diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice to evaluate our online programs. And one of the three key questions of that evaluation is to what extent uh, our participants are experiencing adult programs as accessible what inhibits and supports accessibility in online programming. We hope to have that final report uh, by the end of the year and use this evaluation to support our planning for future online programs moving forward. So with that, I will, um, I will end there and I'll pass it back to you, Damon. Well, thank you so much. Um, I knew a lot of that, but I, I didn't have the, the full grasp. Um, I, I'd like to put a shout out to the Clifford Still Museum when the museum first opened, I called the education director at the time and introduced myself and told her I'd like to bring over a group of autistic students or students with autism. And they didn't even blink an eye. They said, yeah, come on down. We'll figure this out as we go. So I think my favorite um, thing that you said was the idea of explor exploration without perfection. So I think that that's um, something that we can all take away. So thank you, Nicole. Um, I think next up, let's go ahead and have my friend Emily von Swearingen. Um, Emily, there's Emily. Um, Emily has been a teaching artist with us for, oh God, probably 20 years, if, if not longer. Um, Emily is, um, I'm gonna let Emily tell you a little bit about what she's doing now, but Emily has been able to do projects in as diverse of settings as one could imagine. Always has great ideas, always takes, um, a germ of an idea and makes it fully formed without um, a whole lot of um, prompting or, or um, cajoling. It's just a pleasure to work with Emily. Um, she was so excited to talk about the work that she's doing now um, at the Colorado Center for the Blind and Rocky Mountain Deaf School.
So take it away, my friend, Emily. Okay. Well, gosh, I'm blushing. Thank you for the gracious introduction. Uh, my name is Emily von Swearingen, and I, I'm currently working with uh, Access Gallery, but I also work with Think360 Arts for Learning and sometimes with the Art Garage and also as an independent contract artist. I'm currently funded by the Arts and Society Grant. I, it, when the pandemic hit, I was working with the Rocky Mountain Deaf School and we got shut up and everybody had to switch to virtual learning. And it was a big adjustment because working with the students who are deaf, we all had to learn how to use Zoom and be able to sign to each other. Um, we tried to adapt the programs that we were doing for home learning, but what we quickly found out was that the students lacked basic materials. And <laughs> it's one thing to be able to create projects and put them together, but if students don't have the ability then to actually participate, then that is not inclusive. So thankfully, uh, Damon was able to reroute some money from Access Gallery, and we actually compiled art kits specifically for projects that we were going to do, and then we actually delivered them directly to students' homes. So then they had, that was a very exciting day for everybody, and they all got to show their kits and whatnot. Uh, one thing I wanted to, to make people aware of is that students who are deaf, English is a second language. So ASL is a primary language. And it's important that if you're captioning content for audiences to understand that English is a second language and it may be difficult for some of your participants to be able to you know, read what's happening. So we came up with an idea of actually screencasting in the content of tutorials. Screencasting is the ability for somebody to ASL interpret within the content of a tutorial. So I would make tutorials as a PDF and then my collaborator, Tiffany Hogland, uh, who's a teacher at uh, Rocky Mountain Deaf School, would then screencast that content. Basically, she shows up in a circle in the content and can maneuver around in the content. And then that is converted into an MP4 file, a video file. And then that is posted online. You can see some examples of that that we've done for drafts at the Access Gallery website under online resources and then under Emily's Creative Cache. I then was able to get a grant, thankfully, from Arts and Society to be able to fund these projects further. So I'm in process of creating tutorials on a variety of uh, artists and art movements, and then being able to work virtually with students at the Rocky Mountain Deaf School. They actually make the project examples that get included into the tutorial, and then we're actually screencasting that project, and that'll be posted. So. So more to come on that. Um, I'm back working with students um, at the Rocky Mountain Deaf School on a theater project. We are putting together a production of Tinkerbell in ASL and I've been working virtually with them on making their costume elements. And this is funded by uh, Think360 Arts for Learning. So this is, <laughs> you can imagine it's a little bit difficult to do, um, but the way we've set it up in the classroom is that there's a hybrid learning model. So there are students who are in-person learning at the school, but there are also students who are at home, including myself. And so in the classroom, every student is at a monitor. And so we can all communicate in sign via Zoom. They can communicate with each other in the classroom, but it really is fully inclusive. We don't feel like we're just watching. Right? We feel like we're all kind of working together. Um, I live pretty close to the school, so I'm able to go back and forth and drop off supplies and pick them up. I mean, this weekend I have to put the lights on Tinkerbell's wings and then those go back and then they put the fabric on and <laughs> that's the collaborative process that we've tried to put together. I am also working back in person with students who are blind at the Colorado Center for the Blind. Thankfully, that's also funded by I think 360 Arts for Learning. And we're working on tactile forms of weaving. And working with people who are blind, there's a lot of one-on-one -on -one contact. I cannot maintain that six foot distance, right? I have to be able to actually be working with their hands and, and very close quarters. So we are being very proactive with our you know, washing of our hands and you know, everybody's wearing masks. And I actually wear um, 
I, are we going to circle back around to PP Damon later? Since you're there, go ahead and go ahead and talk about it now. Oh, okay. I'll talk about it now. So one of the things that I'm really excited to find, particularly in working with students who are deaf, when I go back to start working with them in person, it's really difficult to communicate with somebody who's wearing a mask. You know, a lot of uh, sign language really is from this part up, and it isn't about reading lips, it's about the expressions in the face. If I'm asking somebody something like where or why, you know, I'm using my face with that, and if part of that's covered up, it's really difficult to understand. So there's a wonderful product that's made by a company called Rapid Response out of Juneau, Alaska, and this is called a Humanity Shield, and it is basically a shield that allows me then to see and communicate. It's across the head, and it has this kind of fused fabric so that it's not permeable, you can actually sanitize it then. So for now, I'm wearing this with my students who are blind and um, a surgical mask on the inside as well. And I'll put the link to this um, item in the chat. I know that they're having a sale right now and free shipping. So I think it's worth looking into in terms of being able to be accessible with your, with your students. I think that is about enough right now, right, Damon? <laughs> I keep muting myself. Yeah, that that's wonderful. We're going to circle back around and take um, questions from the audience here in a minute. But um, you know, Emily struck on a very interesting point that I think we can all relate to. I think very early in the pandemic, um, we were all delivering art supplies, and and we sort of got into this mode of realizing that there was a lot more um, need out there in some of our various communities than we had ever imagined we realized pretty quickly on that a lot of our artists were also, or a lot of our clients were also very food insecure. So we were delivering pizza and art supplies uh, for a while. And um, I've been so excited to keep up with Emily and see what she's been doing with these two groups that are very close and near and dear to, to our hearts. So I can't wait to see what the tactile weaving projects are looking like. And I, I don't think I've told Emily this, but we have a full loom available to us now. So maybe next really year we cool. can, yeah, so. Well, we're um, actually, we actually made a loom. Yeah. So uh, yeah. thankfully at the Colorado Center for the Blind, there's a full wood shop. And I work oh, with students right. to learn how to use machinery and tools. And we actually made a 48 by 40, well, uh, we're almost done, 48 by 40 yeah. inch, inch frame loom. That'll be put on the wall and it's a collaborative effort. So people can all contribute to this one big weaving We'll leave it on the loom as part of an art piece. If we take it off, it'll be too floppy. Um, but I'm pretty excited about that because it's a real tactile experience. We're actually adding 3D elements as well. And then everybody's working on their own individual uh, cardboard looms. Sounds good. Well, if you need more cardboard looms, if anyone needs more cardboard looms, let <laughs> us know. We have, we have a supply. So next up, I'd like to introduce my friend Lisa from the Lone Tree Art Center, who's um, got a slightly different take on how they've approached accessibility. Um, Lone Tree is very well known for accessibility just across the board. I, I was on a Zoom call one day and the mayor popped, the mayor of Denver popped on and gave a big shout out to Lone Tree. And I thought that was really, really cool. Um, and he was really talking about the accessibility and, and the way that they were able to still do a live performance uh, with social distancing. So um, Lisa, you wanna take it away? Yes, thanks so much, Damon. And you know, this is a really exciting uh, webinar for me too, hearing Nicole and Emily talk about the things that they're doing. And I'm writing all kinds of notes to myself because I think one of the great opportunities that we have is to learn from each other. And as, um, you know, as we continue to hear about creative ways that people are adapting, we can use those ourselves. So um, as Damon said, you know, we're, um, as a live performing arts organization, accessibility is really important to us. And we've focused on two key constituencies. The first um, is constituency of people with intellectual or developmental disabilities in our sensory friendly programming. And the second is seniors with Alzheimer's or early memory loss. And we have a pretty robust program for seniors who are also um, considered fairly vulnerable. And so I just want to talk about those two programs because I think there's one where 
we were able to successfully pivot, um, particularly to an online delivery and the other not so much. So our sensory friendly programming, um, many of you are familiar with the term, it really is delivering authentic, um, full arts, live performing arts um, performances with just some modifications so that if someone is particularly sensitive to sound or light or um, sudden changes or is not able to sit still and be what used to be the traditional audience member, that they still feel welcomed and they can experience and engage in the arts in a way that anyone else is invited to. So the key to this sensory friendly programming for us is welcoming people into our building. And so the um, when we were able to reopen, which um, very, uh, we're very grateful and thankful that we were able to reopen to in-person performances by the end of July um, with all kinds of um, protocols in place to keep people safe, we began um, reprogramming our sensory uh, friendly performances because the, the isolation around this population of performing arts is pretty profound. And it's the ability to come into a theater and experience that live performance that I think is so key to the success of our and every other sensory friendly program. But what we have found and it's continued through the fall is that our sensory friendly programs and our families, because ours are really geared towards families, they're not coming. They're, you know, whatever challenges they're facing right now, whatever um, concerns they have about keeping themselves and their loved ones safe, it's resulted in very modest ticket sales for our sensory friendly programs. So um, we've remained committed to making these in-person sensory, sensory friendly programs available even with, a, even with a tiny audience. The rule is we have to have more people in the audience than on stage and we've been able to do that so far. But even just to provide that live experience for one or two families who, for whom it might be um, the best day they've had in many, many weeks, it's still important that we do that. But we made the determination that there's no way to transfer that kind of experience online. There's no way to deliver that virtually. And so we will continue to do our in-person sensory friendly programming, but at this point we are just not able to um, really envision a way to deliver programming virtually that would be unlike something that they already have access to. Having said that, um, our programs for those with Alzheimer's or early memory loss, as well as our um, vulnerable senior population, have proven to be incredibly successful with virtual delivery. So we have two programs. One is called Arts in the Afternoon, which is a monthly program where we bring in professional artists, professional musicians mostly, um, and it becomes an, it's an hour long concert with uh, sort of lifelong learning um, that is uh, woven throughout it. So Betsy Schwarm, who is a well-known music historian and, and a great, great presenter, sometimes narrates some of these concerts. And, and because they are uh, in the middle of the week at 1.30 in the afternoon and, and they're very affordable and it's um, also uh, a fairly short program, we have developed a great audience. Uh, a lot of groups come from senior living facilities. A lot of adults come who might uh, otherwise feel uncomfortable driving at night or in a very large crowd. We keep the audiences deliberately small. And um, we, we thought that we would be successful if we could transfer that program online because we heard from our, a, lot of, a lot of our patrons, we're just not comfortable coming and, and sitting in the theater. So practically speaking, we um, invested about $3,500 in camera and streaming equipment. Um, we, our production team went through a crash course, self-taught in video production. We invited the artists onto our main stage and then we actually live streamed their concerts. And the way that we delivered it was through a private YouTube channel. <clears throat> these continue to be ticketed events. So through the pi private YouTube channel, we could um, give ticket buyers a unique link about a day before so that they could um, sign on to the performance. 
And in addition, um, we included a, a moderator so we could moderate any chat that happened during the concert answered and answering questions. So pre-COVID, our attendance at these Arts in the Afternoon um, performances was usually between about 75 and 125 people per performance on a monthly basis. Since we've switched to our virtual delivery, we find that the attendance is usually between 50 and 150. So some, some programs are less, some programs are more, but we've seen a consistent uh, attendance at every single one that we've done since May. I think we've done eight of them. And um, that not only did that allow us to reach that population, it also gave us the confidence to begin um, exploring virtual um, presentation of our main stage performances. So we've done that in several instances and it's also been very successful. So that I think is something, I know we'll talk a little bit about what we've, what we've learned. I think one of the things we've learned is that it is a really valuable tool to reach those vulnerable people who do not feel comfortable or are not able to come to the theater but still have a hunger for that engagement. I think our biggest success story in terms of pivoting with accessibility in mind in the time of COVID is our Spark Alliance program. Um, the Spark Alliance program is uh, several uh, organizations participate throughout the metro area. It is a program that is a guided engagement experience for people with Alzheimer's or early memory loss as well as their caregivers, typically a spouse, often an adult, um, an adult child. And we have been doing um, Spark programming for several years now. I want to give a quick shout out. Our program started here because of the um, dedication and determination of Robin Skirto, who is in our development team, but she brought the program to us, um, courtesy of the Alzheimer's Association and really spearheaded it for several years. And now we're um, incredibly lucky to have Janine Madden, who is one of our super volunteers who really has become sort of the creative head for that program for us. So uh, just a shout out to both of them on our, on our um, webinar. So the, the Spark Alliance, it's a, a guided um, opportunity for people to engage and it sparks curiosity. It helps um, people access memories by um, visual arts engagement, by storytelling, by singing by dancing uh, we have a lot of different ways that we engage with the um, with those with alzheimer's or early memory loss what we decided uh sort of uh um like what nicole was saying earlier was that zoom is absolutely the platform for this kind of experience because zoom um allows for a sort of immediate interaction but i think most importantly it allows participants to see each other. And one of the things that the families um, of people with Alzheimer's early memory loss really crave is connection and interaction with others. And so the isolation that they feel typically is, is so amplified right now. And to be able to actually see or hear or experience other people on, um, on a call, on a Zoom call has, has helped them retain some of that. One of the things we haven't done, but of course, in as I said, in, in the continued learning, especially um, talk, hearing Nicole is, I think that we need to start exploring ways to uh, add other accessibility, whether it is the captioning, whether it is ASL interpretation. So that's something that I think we can also, also think about. So the reason I think that this has been our biggest success story is because we've actually seen our audiences, our participation grow from when we did it in person to out now that we're doing it virtually. And that may speak to um, people wanting to stay at home. It may speak to challenges they may have getting out on any given day. And so I think that moving forward to the extent that we can, maybe it's one virtual and one in person, that will become a feature of our work moving forward. We're still committed to reopening. Um, we, we are open, but to welcoming audiences in for those live and in-person engagement experiences with the arts when we can and as safely as we can do it. But uh, necessity is the mother of invention and I am just grateful that we are in such a digitally advanced and virtual world that 
we could, without skipping many beats, continue to deliver some of our really important programming. Not all of it, but some of it. And so I'm, um, I feel it's been a, it's been a long, long, however many months it has been, however many years it's been, it feels like forever, but we've learned a lot. And so I'm really excited about what the future holds for our accessibility programs, even in terms of increasing them. Well, thank you so much. I, I so appreciated the fact that you mentioned that some things worked and some things didn't. And mm -hmm. I, I think we have to just, um, I've, I've always said accessibility is a journey, not a destination. And um, I really second everything. I think all of us, all three of you mentioned the idea of isolation and, and closing that gap and, and having technology help us. Um, before we open it up to everyone in the audience, I want to ask each of you just to reflect about sort of your aha moment that, you know, accessibility may not be an afterthought, it may be the point or, um, you know, for me, we were doing a, uh, uh, an opening and normally we would have a lot of people coming into the gallery and we were doing it virtually and we had people from all over the country and people that we hadn't seen in years that couldn't come in. And I'm like, so technology works on some level for all of us. I, I think some of the adaptations we have to make for some of the different populations we work with are um, we're seeing more and more that we can make those accommodations and actually make um, um, some of our artists and some of our students have really thrived during this time. So I'd love to hear from each of you sort of that aha moment or that real kernel of truth about um, what we've learned about accessibility in the age of COVID and, and things that you plan on maybe continuing after after we're back to uh, whatever new normal looks like. Yeah. I'll hop in just since, uh, since I just uh, okay. finished uh, our, talking about our programs. I think that, you know, ours was a collective aha moment and what it, and really what it boiled down to was we miss these people. We miss our sensory friendly families. We miss seeing our regular spark attendees. We miss, we just literally had an emotional reaction about, we know how important these programs are and how much they mean to them, and we can't see them anymore. And, and we feel that ache and we're sure that they feel it too. And so it was just really a, a, a most basic emotional response for us that, that drove us to innovate and figure out how to do as much as we could. Thank you, that was, that was wonderful. Nicole? Yeah, I think I'll echo what both you and Lisa have said. It's like in the beginning of the pandemic, we were like, oh no, we need to learn this technology and adapt our programs to these platforms. And now we're just starting to realize the incredible opportunities that exist in doing things digitally and all of the different accessibility features. I mean, like you're both saying, reaching audiences. I mean, I think it was a couple weeks ago um, we did a virtual tour for a senior center in Brooklyn, you know, that would not have necessarily mm -hmm. ever been able to come to the museum and experience um, it for themselves. So I think our big, one of our many big ahas and takeaways is that this isn't going anywhere. And there, there will be a digital and online aspect to our program moving forward um, and thinking about how we're creating access and expanding our reach and the people that we can serve. So yeah, really shifting views on technology and, and what we can do. Yes, I hate to admit it because I'm not a big fan of some of the technology. And early on, I kept saying some of our people can't get on Zoom. Now I think we've had almost all of our folks on Zoom. And for some people, it's actually a better pl platform than, than in person. So Emily, you want to round us out? I do. We um, found out this week actually that all students at the Rocky Mountain Deaf School are now going virtually and this will be at least into mid-January. We originally were planning on doing our production of Tinkerbell and ASL as a live performance in an outdoor amphitheater in the spring and it looks like that may not be a possibility. So now we are having to think about how can we put together this performance uh, digitally as a video mm -hmm. production and and we had even set up a green screen and we were doing special effects and whatnot. Um, 
at the school and then virtually, but now all students have moved back home. So I think we're exploring ideas of how can we then incorporate forms of animation into that as well. It, it's really thinking outside the box and constantly adapting to all of these changes that keep, it really feels like it's getting thrown at you. Um, I particularly am a huge fan of the screencasting component now. And, you know, when I finish off my arts and society project, we'll probably have about 15 different types of tutorials with screencasted projects in them. And those can live beyond the actual project that's being done with students. It can be accessed by, you know, people online, which I really love that. Um, yeah. I think that's... That's, yeah, I was, uh, the first time I saw the screencasting, I was so excited because I've always thought, you know, way back when the iPods first were introduced, I was like, oh my God, you could videotape an ASL interpreter and go on like a travel log with them. And oh. I never got that idea up off the ground. But now that I see technology changing and some of these ideas are, are less foreign than they used to be, I think that that's, um, I have a love-hate relationship with technology, but um, I, I, I am appreciating it more and more. We did have a question, and this is sort of, we can just open this up to everyone, about have you had any budgetary constraints or what have you learned in terms of the cost of accessibility? And we can just open that up to anyone. Nicole's shaking her head, so I'm, uh, it's like, let's just start with you. <laughs> okay, well, um, it's an interesting no pressure. <laughs> I know, it's an interesting question. Um, Certainly, you know, some of these things cost money, like having, you know, a pro Zoom account, um, Otter is a subscription service, you know, there are um, budgetary considerations for a lot of these sorts of accommodations. Um, but then we're also learning that there's just a lot of different things that you can do that don't cost money. And, you know, one thing that we've been talking about more recently is, you know, adding in more verbal description into our programming and things like that. So I think that there's um, there's always chance to think about things that are free or very low cost. And then, you know, of course, there's always um, really more expensive things that you can incorporate into your program. But yeah, I think there's just such a range of options that you can think about depending on the needs of your program and your audiences. And one of the things that I've often argued is that the cost of accessibility far outweighs the far outweigh, I mean, the benefits far outweigh the cost. I was saying that backwards and I knew I was saying it backwards, but the benefits to your entire audience. Um, I, I always encourage people to use the captioning because we are all sometimes multitasking. Sometimes you can read along or um, if somebody has um, um, hearing loss, there, there are certain things that don't cost anything to make the online environment that much better. So. Uh, Lisa or Emily, would you like to add anything about budgetary constraints or, or op opportunities? I'll just say that the technology that we're using, a lot of that is actually free. Yeah, They're downloadable yeah. apps, you know, and you can you can pay to have a premium subscription, but um, screencasting is actually a, a free program. I'm sure that there are yeah. probably different versions out there. Yeah. But, um, do you want to say a word about Braille, Emily? I do, I do. And I see that there's a comment about best practices and verbal descriptions. So um, one of the things that I'm doing through my Arts and Society grant with my students who are blind is we're actually recording them uh, giving audio descriptives of their work and their process. And these can then accompany their artwork if it goes to travel to say like a conference at the National Federation of the Blind or in an exhibit. I want to just mention that only about 10% of people who are blind read and write Braille. And mm -hmm. so it's wonderful to be inclusive and always include Braille if it's possible in whatever you're doing. But your audience is also fairly limited in that. So it is important, I feel, nowadays to also be exploring uh, audio descriptives. And somebody asked a question about best practices and verbal description. Um, Damon, you did a fantastic job in your introduction of yourself and describing um, what you look like and where you are. You know, those details, I think, even things like colors can be included in your descriptives. Um, my name is Emily and I'm sitting in my little home office and I'm sitting in front of my bookcase has lots of books and different objects in there 
and I have long wavy red hair and my cat is sitting in the window looking at squirrels. You know, something like that is really encompasses basically what you see in my little screen. Um, so think about that in terms of when you're using descriptives. And I do know that we are working on one of our upcoming um, webinars will be around audio description and, and verbal description of, of both visual art and um, if we can squeeze it in um, um, performing art. Uh, I ran across an article this morning while I have Lisa answer this question, I'll go see if I can find it, about just even using simpler language as an accessibility tool. So um, Lisa, do you have any thoughts about budgetary concerns or, or opportunities? Um, you know, as I mentioned, our initial investment was about $3,500 in, in camera and um, streaming technology tools. And especially since we are live streaming performances, those really aren't as effective uh, via Zoom, um, you know, uh, particularly if we want, to, want them to be of the professional quality that the artists are really demonstrating. Um, I think that uh, my hope would be that one of the opportunities that all of our experiences um, have afforded is um, from a funder's perspective, a recognition that there is a tremendous opportunity to help uh, cultural and other organizations around the country increase accessibility um, really quickly and really easily because we've all we've managed to patch it together we've all managed to patch things together but now you know we've we've figured it out on a basic level and there are I would hope funders who would say this has been a tremendous um, uh, maybe it's a breakthrough at least it's an improvement on the number of people who can engage now and so we want to continue to encourage that increased participation. I think that that's very true. I think people are now seeing, funders are now seeing the importance of not leaving people behind. Um, I think the most obvious example is some of the early reports of COVID and, and people living in nursing homes and being so isolated. And we've all mentioned and I'll talk about certain parts of the groups that we like to work with or that we work with being very isolated. They were isolated before. So mm -hmm. if we can use technology and some of these things that we've learned to diminish that, that isolation as we move forward, I think that's all the better. Um, we did have a question about um, if anyone's seeing any big gaps in service, any populations that we may not be reaching. Um, I, I personally still believe that some of the people that are living in some of the um, congregate settings just due to the nature of COVID and, and that there there's um, some very isolated folks in nursing homes and, and assisted living facilities. And I think that that's an area that we could all do better. We, we did a project not too long ago and it was great because the, the facility had closed caption TV. Like when you go to a hotel and you're, you have that closed menu. So even technology as simple as the TV can help bridge the gap. But are you all seeing any any other um, gaps in services or things that you'd like to explore a little bit more? If I, I could just follow up. up. Sorry, if I could just follow up. Go ahead, up, Emily. Then, oh. Yeah. So I, I'll just uh, follow up and say that our RC afternoon program that I was describing to you, what we have learned is that many um, senior living facilities are buying a ticket and then broadcasting it over their sort of propriety, proprietary um, TV network. Now, obviously those are, you know, the much more affluent senior living facilities. And so, um, so there's still, I think, uh, sort of a, a wealth gap or an income gap in terms of the resources available. Um, and it's, and you know, the thing is, it's not just the isolation, it's got to be the crushing anxiety. You're in a congregate living mm -hmm. facility and you know that's that's um, what we know is a really high risk so you know if there's a way to help alleviate that anxiety people singing outside or you know actually mm -hmm. we have a we have a facility right across the street from our art center and our um, teen volunteers are delivering notes to them they're just sending them notes to say we're thinking about you and do you want a pen pal <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. And, and sometimes I think the simplest solutions 
are, are really right in front of us. Um, somebody mentioned you could use Zoom with just a phone. Um, there, there's Sometimes we don't have to go down the technology route. I, I mentioned earlier, we were delivering art supplies and pizza earlier on um, during the, the summer months. Um, I had a thought and then I forgot about it. So Nicole, do you see any sort of gaps in service or um, areas you still want to explore further? I think I would echo some of what Lisa is saying, certainly about access to technology depending on economic um, conditions. I think recently we've been seeing, we're doing all of our, I didn't mention this, but we're doing all of our school visits online now. Um, we've been doing that since the fall and recently we've been visiting some early learning classrooms in particular and we're just seeing such a difference in their access to technology, their comfort levels with using technology. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, especially with very young children, you know, they want to be seeing people interacting with people being very active. And so we've been thinking about that a lot about how we can think about more outreach based programming um, and creating access um, in particular for very young children. So I guess I'm talking about the other end of the life spectrum from from Lisa, right. but sort of a similar idea. Right. You know, and actually something you said sparked what I was trying to say. I think we also have to really take into account there is a real digital divide still within this country and um, it seems to affect people with disabilities even almost on a double level because a lot of people with disabilities don't have the economic ability to have high-speed internet. Now I do know there's companies and there's a lot of people looking at those issues but early on the, the pandemic, we were working with our families. Some of them didn't even have internet or they had computers that didn't have cameras. So I think the, the, there is a digital divide and I think that's also another opportunity for us to, to think about. Um, about five minutes left. I would like to ask if there's any other questions um, coming from the audience or any other thoughts, comments from, from the panelists. I would just encourage everyone that's on the call to, <laughs> to lean on your colleagues in the community and beyond. I mean, as we've said, there's just, there's so much access to people across the country and internationally to look at other yeah. models and find other resources that might be accessible and, um, and appropriate for your particular needs. Uh, we're all in this together. We're all asking the same questions. Yeah. Um, so um, yeah, I would just, it's like Damon said, it's totally worth it. And um, I would just encourage everybody to keep, keep trucking and experimenting. Yeah. Yeah, experimentation seems to be a, a hot word today. Um, not everything we try is going to work, but, but um, like Nicole said, we are all in the same boat. We're all trying to figure this out together. And I've been really encouraged about the, the response to accessibility during this pandemic from so many different arts organizations. Um, one of the earliest things that I saw that really made me stop and um, just really smile for a day was when we saw the live band performances outside the Kavod Towers. These are um, high rise apartment buildings that house uh, primarily low income seniors and they were all on lockdown. So these bands would start going out and just playing in the street and the music would locked up. And some of our opportunities for accessibility have nothing to do with high tech. It, it's as simple as maybe writing a letter or starting a pen pal um, we're doing a postcard project at the gallery where people with developmental disabilities are drawing postcards to send to people in Chicago that also have developmental disabilities. So um, sometimes technology is wonderful, but sometimes just the act of creation is, is really at the impetus of accessibility. Um, I think we're running out of time. I would like to thank the panelists again. I'd love to thank uh, Colorado Creative Industries and uh, the Denver Film for uh, making this all possible. It's been wonderful. Is there, um, I, I would like to encourage people to visit the Art of Access website. We do have a lot of shared resources there. We will be doing other webinars um, in the upcoming months. Most notably, I know we're gonna do something around audio description, so uh, tune back in. Thank you all for spending your lunch hour with us. Libby, do you have any last minute um, instructions or 
Anything I'll, uh, I forgot? I'll let Libby jump on if she is oh, okay. here and wants to say anything. I just wanted to reiterate too that the recording of this is going to be up on the Colorado Office of Film, Television, and Media's Thank YouTube you. page by the end of the day. So if you know somebody who missed it or if you just want to review some of the resources, um, it'll be up there by 5 p.m. I just want to thank everyone so much for being here this afternoon. It was so informative and just a great conversation. Thank you for all the work you're doing. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you for pulling it all together. Great. Well, all right. everyone have a great afternoon and a great weekend. All right. Thanks, Nicole, everybody. Lisa, Emily, everyone, thank you all so much. We'll, we'll be in touch soon. Keep up the good work. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Thank you.